Dr. Ved Datta. Uh, he is, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Ved uh, in brief. So he is uh, currently an assistant professor of mathematics at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, he received a PhD in math from Rutgers and in 2014. So thereafter, uh, Dr. Ved spent uh, some time it, at UC Berkeley, where he did his uh, postdoc for three years. And he's a, very much a geometric analyst and he's interested in complex geometry as well. So today he will speak on moment maps and canonical metrics in complex geometry. So over to you, Dr. Uh, thanks Shiv for the uh, introduction and also thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. Um, it seems like a great initiative and hopefully it will be repeated uh, in, in years to come. Uh, so my talk will be largely uh, expository. Uh, and I won't uh, actually, apart from a very sort of small mention, I won't really talk about my own work at all. So uh, the talk will uh, broadly be about uh, uh, sort of one instance of a rather uh, ubiquitous principle in uh, Kähler geometry, namely the uh, Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence. So this is uh, this correspondence seeks to sort of uh, construct bridges between uh, differential geometry on one side and algebraic geometry on the other side. And uh, the first instance of this was in fact uh, the uh, Narasimhan Seshadri theorem. So it's rather unfortunate that uh, Professor Seshadri is not with us anymore, but uh, of course, I mean, his immense contributions will far outlive him and will continue to inspire us. So I'm of course also an alumni of uh, CMI, the institute that he founded. And I read somewhere that uh, when he was visiting Harvard, he uh, observed that a uh, mathematician of the stature of Raoul Bott had to teach calculus to undergrads. And that got him thinking that in India, we have this sort of artificial divide between research institutes and uh, universities. So of course now uh, uh, with more and more ICERs uh, and more and more IITs sort of hiring people who do active research, this going away slowly. And of course, ISC also now has an undergrad program, but uh, Professor Seshadri was definitely a pioneer uh, in India uh, uh, for this. And, 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 and I mean, for this reason, he'll continue to uh, inspire me in other ways than just his mathematics. So, uh, so yeah, let me start with the talk. This is sort of a brief uh, outline. I'll first, uh, talk a bit about uh, the, the main problem, which is to construct constant scalar curvature, scalar metrics. Uh, I'll then uh, take a detour and talk a bit about geometric invariant theory, uh, which is sort of a finite dimensional uh, analog and motivation for the Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence. And then finally, I'll, uh, I'll describe what the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture is and what are sort of the recent developments and what are the broad general problems that people uh, will be working on in, in the future. So let's start with uh, something very classical, the uniformization theorem. So uh, it's of course well known that uh, sort of two dimensional orientable surfaces are all classified by their genus, that is the number of holes. And there's also a much coarser classification in terms of the sign of the uh, Euler characteristic. So let's say uh, I'm given an orientable surface and a Riemannian metric ds squared, then there exists isothermal coordinates near every point. So in, in these coordinates, your metric looks diagonal. And the advantage is that the Gauss curvature then has a very nice uh, formula. So you should remember this formula because you'll see something similar later on. And then, of course, by the uh, classical Gauss-Bonnet theorem, uh, the total curvature is a multiple of the Euler characteristic. So then uh, one form of the uniformization theorem is that given any compact oriented two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, there exists a metric conformal to, to the original Riemannian metric, which means it's a multiple of the original Riemannian metric. And this new metric has constant Gauss curvature. So a more uh, sort of classical way of uh, stating the uniformization theorem is that uh, given any compact Riemann surface, its universal cover is either uh, P1, which is just the sphere or C or, uh, or, or, or the disc. 
And so the contact between these two statements is made by the observation that if X and Y are isothermal coordinates for G, then Z uh, is, is a local holomorphic coordinate. Uh, so, so the set of, uh, I mean, if you fix a G, the set of all metrics that are conformal to G, uh, they're set to, uh, they're called the conformal class of G. Uh, so more, uh, much of uh, geometric analysis in the 20th century was driven by attempts to generalize uniformization theorem and many of these continue Two sort of obvious directions of generalization. One, one, uh, one can just uh, sort of seek a verbatim generalization of the uniformization theorem. So given a Riemannian metric, you seek a conformal metric with constant scalar curvature. But I'll actually talk about the second problem, which is uh, given a Kähler manifold, instead of looking at conformal classes, you look at Kähler classes and you seek a Kähler form, which has constant scalar curvature, right? So I'll first, uh, I'll need to describe what all these terms mean. So in the next two slides, I'll sort of give you a quick crash course on uh, Kähler geometry. Okay, so, uh, so let M be a compact complex manifold of dimension N. Then uh, this induces uh, an almost complex structure. So this is basically just an endomorphism of the tangent bundle whose square is minus identity. And in local, uh, real and imaginary parts of the holomorphic coordinates, one can explicitly write down what this J looks like. And in fact, these uh, sort of local transition functions satisfying the Cauchy-Riemann equations is equivalent to uh, this J. Uh, I mean, this is a local definition for J, but this is equivalent to this J actually defining a global endomorphism. And so then we have this J, this almost complex structure. We also take a a compatible Riemannian metric. So this is basically a smoothly, I mean, a Riemannian metric is just a smoothly varying uh, inner product on the tangent space. And you want it to be compatible in the sense that J is an isometry. So then uh, from this data, one can uh, concoct a real positive 1-1 one -one form called the associated 1-1 one -one form. And so when I say real positive 1-1, one -one, I just mean that locally you can write omega as this, where uh, uh, this G alpha beta bar is a local matrix of functions which are Hermitian and positive definite, right? So uh, we say that this Riemannian metric is scalar if uh, this associated one one form is closed. So that, this, that might appear to be a rather uh, artificial condition, but it turns out that this is precisely the condition that's needed to sort of marry the Riemannian geometry with the complex geometry. So uh, <clears throat> what do I mean by that? So the Kähler condition is equivalent to the statement that uh, if you take the Levi-Civita connection, then the uh, complex structure is actually parallel with respect to the, uh, the Levi-Civita connection. So geometrically, this means that if you take a one zero vector field, if you parallel transport it, it will continue to remain one zero. Uh, from an analyst point of view, this also means that uh, there exists holomorphic coordinates ZI so that uh, locally your matrices are Euclidean up to the second order. Okay, so uh, of course G alpha beta bar is positive uh, and Hermitian. So of course by a linear change of coordinates, one can always diagonalize it at a point. And in fact, uh, the diagonal uh, will be the, uh, in, in fact, the, uh, uh, at that point will be the Euclidean metric. But more importantly, one can introduce a quadratic change of variables so that uh, one can actually also kill the order Z term. And of course, one can't play this game further because uh, the quadratic terms, the order Z square terms uh, also encode information about the curvature of G. So you can't sort of wish them away by a simple change of variables or by any change of variables. Okay, so because omega is closed, uh, it represents, and it's real, uh, it represents uh, a cohomology class in the second Dirac cohomology, but it also represents a class in the 1-1 Dolbo cohomology. So I'll denote this intersection 
by h11 of mr and the class alpha so so this guy is 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 a finite dimensional vector space so class alpha in the space is said to be scalar if they are in that class and it turns out that the set of scalar classes is an open convex cone denoted by a uh, script uh, k and this sits inside this finite dimensional vector space so much of the power of uh, scalar geometry comes from this uh, rather elementary dd bar lemma which says that if you take any two cohomologous scalar matrix then they differ by dd bar of a function right uh, so a priori because they are cohomologous they only differ by d of some one form but then uh, in the scalar setting you can actually refine this further and uh, go sort of one step down and say that it's d d bar of a function so in this sense uh, i mean it it helps in reducing many of the tensorial equations in scalar geometry to scalar equations so in this sense uh, scalar geometry is similar to conformal geometry where again you only have one unknown function to work with rather than working with unknown tensors okay so let me give you uh, quickly give you some examples of uh, scalar manifolds so the first uh, simplest examples are, uh, are riemann surfaces so the idea is that uh, you take any compatible riemannian metric then the area form is is the associated one one form and then because uh, n has complex dimension 1 of course uh, d of the area form is going to be zero uh another sort of simple model example is that the complex flat space our euclidean space uh, which has a natural uh, scalar form and the associated riemannian metric would be the usual euclidean flat metric a more sophisticated example which sort of plays the role of uh, plays the role that the sphere plays in riemannian geometry is that of complex projective space uh, so let me remind you of the definition this is simply uh, the set of lines in cn plus 1 So you mod out C n plus one by C star, uh, where the action is basically the scaling action, and then it turns out that there's a nice uh, Fubini's two D metric, a uh, scalar metric on this, which is called the Fubini's two D metric. Uh, once you know that the complex projective space is scalar, you can construct lots of scalar manifolds because any complex submanifold, and of which there are plenty. uh you can always restrict the fubini sturdy metric to this uh, complex submanifold and you'll again get a scalar metric so now of course you might wonder that all examples might be projective this is wrong because one can consider tori so that's basically just uh, cn mod modded out by a lattice uh, and because the euclidean metric is translation invariant that induces a scalar metric on the torus and it turns out that for a generic choice of this lattice uh this torus is actually not projective right so you can't embed this into cpn uh, so you might also wonder that uh, all complex manifolds are are scalar after all uh, all smooth manifolds have at least one riemannian structure in fact there are infinitely many riemannian structures so you might wonder that maybe uh, every compact complex manifold has a scalar structure this is not correct so you can actually uh, uh, look at this is a classical example so you look at c2 minus the origin modded out by uh, by z where uh, uh, the integers act by certain scaling and it turns out this is not scalar you can easily see the good undergrad exercise that this is diffeomorphic to s1 cross s3 which means that the second betty number is zero but if there were a scalar form that would represent a non trivial second cohomology class so the, so the second cohomology class cannot be trivial so the hof surface is is non scalar okay so now let's talk a bit about curvature so uh, the ricci form of uh, the scalar metric is defined by uh, by this formula so firstly g alpha beta bar is 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 a local matrix but it turns out that this actually defines a global closed form and the expression is very similar to that of the uh, uh, of the gauss curvature if you if you uh, recall what the gauss curvature looked like uh, 
And this is not a coincidence. This is because uh, this form uh, being closed, it represents a certain cohomology class. And in fact, it represents a very canonical cohomology class. It's called the first term class of the manifold. Okay, so in fact, in, in, in the gauss bonnet the integrand that shows up, which is k times dA, is also a representative of the first term class of the uh, Riemann surface, which is why integrating that you get a topological number. Okay, so the scalar curvature is defined by simply tracing the Ricci form with this uh, scalar form omega. So you might wonder what happened to the Riemannian Ricci curvature. It turns out that the Riemannian Ricci curvature is related to this Ricci form the exact same way that the uh, Riemannian metric was related to the scalar form. And in fact, the Riemannian scalar curvature is also a multiple of the sort of scalar scalar curvature. So in scalar geometry, it's customary to forget about the Riemannian Ricci curvature and the Riemannian scalar curvature and only talk about these two, which is what I'll, I'll also do. So a question that Kalabi asked was that given a Kähler manifold and a Kähler class, when does there exist constant scalar curvature Kähler metric in that class? So this is like the uh, Kähler version of the Yamabe problem. So one thing to note is that if there is a constant scalar curvature metric, then that uh, constant value is sort of a topological constant. In other words, if you choose any Kähler metric in alpha, then of course its scalar curvature might not be constant, but the average is always given by this topological constant. Okay. So this uh, question has sort of driven uh, progress in Kähler geometry for much of uh, the last 70 years. So instead of talking about the entire Kähler cone, I'll talk about uh, a sort of lattice within the Kähler cone. So I'll talk about what are called as integral Kähler classes. Uh, although now, by now much of this discussion has been generalized to uh, non-integral Kähler classes also, but there are more technicalities involved. And uh, yeah, so, so there are more technicalities involved. So what are integral Kähler classes? Let's just take uh, a holomorphic line bundle. So this is basically locally, if, uh, if you choose, uh, you can choose trivialization so that the line bundle looks like M cross C or, or an open set cross C. And then you have some gluing data, right? So then we say that L is ample. If you look at this quantity, so, so uh, what is this quantity? This quantity is essentially, uh, uh, right. Uh, is, if you take a Hermitian metric H and L, which means you have a fiber wise Hermitian product, which varies smoothly, then, uh, this quantity is essentially the curvature of this Hermitian metric. So you take a certain multiple of the curvature of the Hermitian metric, then that uh, is an element of the uh, first turn class of the line bundle. So no matter what Hermitian metric you pick, this omega h will always be contained in C1 of L. And C1 of L is actually contained in a lattice in H11 of MR. So we say that L is ample if there exists some Hermitian metric H so that omega H is a Kähler form. And why are ample line bundles important? Uh, they're important because uh, there exists an ample line bundle of, on a manifold if and only if it's projected by a theorem of Kodaira. Okay, so, so that's why ample line bundles are important. Uh, so I said, uh, I mean, that uh, ample, you have an ample line bundle if and only if uh, your manifold is projective. So uh, we ought to at least construct one ample line bundle on a projective space. So on PN, there is a, a tautological line bundle. Uh, uh, so so uh, uh, whose fiber over every point is basically the line uh, corresponding to this point. Remember, every point of PN corresponds to a line in CN plus one. And it turns out that all these lines sort of fit together so that uh, you actually get a line bundle that's called the tautological line bundle. And then the dual of this turns out to be the, uh, turns out to be an ample line bundle. This is called the hyperplane bundle and uh, labeled as O of one. Uh, why O of one? Because it turns out that all holomorphic line bundles can be uh, essentially parameterized by uh, multiples of 
or tensor powers of O of one. Okay, so uh, so now I'm going to be always in the setting of a polarized scalar manifold. That means a manifold with an ample line bundle. Then the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture uh, states that uh, there exists a CSCK metric in this scalar class if and only if the pair is stable. And stable is in quotes because part of the problem is to also uh, uh, understand what is the appropriate stability condition. Okay, so uh, maybe let me make a few remarks before I uh, move on to uh, finite dimensional geometric invariant theory. So firstly, if uh, omega naught is a reference scalar form, then by the DD bar lemma, any other scalar form is uh, omega naught plus DD bar phi. And then phi actually, uh, I mean, if omega solves the CSCK problem, then phi actually solves a fourth order nonlinear PD. So, so Q collects all the sort of nonlinear terms in the expansion of scalar curvature. So the linear part, you can see the principal part is basically like the Laplacian squared. So up to some error, you are, uh, I mean, the linearization is, is the Laplacian square. But of course, this is a, a, a highly nonlinear PD. So solving it is, is, is quite hard. And in fact, uh, nobody knows how to do this in general, which is why this is still a conjecture. So this is an instance of uh, this Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence that I mentioned at the beginning, which uh, is sort of a, a correspondence between uh, existence of canonical metrics on the side of differential geometry and some algebra geometric condition of stability. And usually this correspondence is via solving a nonlinear PD. So, th so this provides a rather fertile ground for, uh, uh, you know, rich interaction between Riemannian geometry uh, uh, analysis via so PDs and algebraic geometry. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the first example was the narsimhan seshadri theorem, which was later generalized by Donaldson, Uhlenbeck, and Yao. And there are also uh, many other instances. One very sort of rather cute uh, example is that of Kehler Einstein metrics on the sphere with cone singularities, which uh, also is of interest to uh, hyperbolic geometers and low dimensional topologists. So in certain circumstances, when the cone angles are below two pi, this is actually connected to an algebra geometric stability condition. All right, so, so now let me describe uh, geometric invariant theory. So the whole point of uh, geometric invariant theory is to be able to construct quotients. Uh, so let's take sort of the simplest example uh, of, of GIT. So, so consider uh, the C star action on, uh, on the two-dimensional projective space. And the idea is to be able to construct a quotient of P2 by C star. Now, if you notice, there are three kinds of orbits. So a generic orbit will basically be, uh, I mean, this is an affine picture, but a generic orbit will be like a hyperbola. But then there are these three special orbits. One is the y-axis, the x-axis, and then the special point uh, zero, zero, 001. Okay. So uh, you can notice that this point zero, zero, 001 is actually in the uh, closure of the orbits of uh, corresponding to the y and the x axes. And so the naive quotient, I mean, if you try to cons construct the usual quotient, that will clearly not be house tall. Right. On the, uh, so, so, so what GIT does is it basically throws away uh, some bad points and it identifies some orbits. So you must have heard this word uh, S equivalence in, in Professor Balaji's uh, talk in the afternoon. And so that is what GIT does. Uh, but before we go on to the actual definition, just consider the uh, sort of coordinate ring of P2, which is basically just the polynomial ring in three variables. Now, the motto is that sort of functions on the quotient should be uh, sort of G invariant functions on, on, on the top. And so if you look at the G invariant functions, that's isomorphic to the two dimensional polynomial ring, which is of course the coordinate ring of P1. So one would expect that any reasonable quotient would be uh, sort of isomorphic to P1. Okay, so now let's uh, actually define what a GIT quotient is. So uh, our setting is going to be much simpler than what is normally considered. Uh, 
So let M be a projective variety and L is, uh, is an ample line bundle, which is simply the restriction of the hyperplane bundle to M. My G is going to be a compact connected subgroup of the unitary group. Uh, such that its complexification also acts holomorphically on M. And then, as I said, the motto is going to be that functions on M mod GC have to be GC invariant functions on M. So here's a definition. Uh, let P be a point in M and P hat be any corresponding lift to a point in CN plus one. So remember, uh, uh, if you have a point in the projective space, it corresponds to uh, an entire line in CN plus one. So just pick some point in that line. Then uh, P is called semi-stable if zero does not belong to the orbit closure of uh, P hat. And it's called polystable if it's semi-stable and also the uh, orbit is in fact closed. Okay. So then the GIT quotient is simply defined uh, by taking the uh, semi-stable points and modding out by an equivalence relation. So P is equivalent to Q if and only if the orbit closures of P and Q intersect. Right? And it turns out that uh, this also parameterizes the set of uh, polystable orbits. Okay. So now I want to, uh, so, so this is the algebraic viewpoint. Now I want to shift and consider uh, what are called as moment maps because that sort of makes contact with uh, the differential geometric side. So with the same setting as before, suppose uh, omega is in, uh, I've written two pi, but let's say omega is in C1 of L. And suppose uh, the subgroup of the unitary group acts by isometries. So this will of course happen if you take omega to be the restriction of the Fubini's 2D metric. Then, uh, in fact, there exists a map from M to the dual of the Lie algebra of G such that uh, if you take the pairing of mu with, uh, so, so you take any psi in G, take the pairing of mu with psi, that's a function on M, take the D of that, that is basically the interior product of, uh, of omega in the direction of psi. Right? Because if you take the Lie algebra element, G acts on psi, so the infinitesimal action of uh, I mean, so, so psi will also uh, induce a vector field on your manifold M. So, so, so this particular thing makes sense. Uh, so if you have seen uh, Hamiltonian actions, this basically means that uh, the sort of one parameter subgroup generated by psi is, is Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian function is given by this pairing. Okay. And then we also want some technical conditions that mu is G equivariant and uh, it turns out in many cases, you can also modify mu by a constant to still keep it G equivariant, but then we want to somehow normalize our moment map so that zero is in mu of M. Then such a map is called a moment map for the action of G on M. And uh, note that there is a G action on mu inverse of zero. So if this action is free, then one can form uh, sort of the Kähler quotient mu inverse of zero by G. So uh, let's first discuss a model case, which also explains why this is called a moment map. So it has something to do with uh, momentum in physics. So take uh, the uh, sort of phase space of uh, N particles. So that's, R to N uh, with position and momentum coordinates uh, Q1 to Qn and P1 to Pn. Then there's a natural Kähler form given by this omega. And let G be the translation group. Uh, then the Lie algebra is just Rn. And in fact, if you take a, a, a vector uh, in the ith position direction, then in fact, the contraction with omega is just dPi. So you can check explicitly that the moment map is basically just the projection to the momentum coordinates, right? And hence the name uh, moment map. So more uh, sophisticated, uh, let's give a couple of other examples. So you can consider the standard unitary action on PN with uh, the Fubini 2D metric omega FS. Uh, then this also has a, 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 a moment map that you can explicitly write down. 
and uh, there's another example uh, if you recall we started this section by talking about a c star action on p2 you can restrict that to the compact subgroup u1 contained inside c star or, or the circle group then this also has a moment map which you can explicitly write down and then one can in fact check that uh, if you take mu inverse of 0 by u of 1 that is actually isomorphic to p1 okay so uh, remember our guess that any git quotient should be uh, of that example should be p1 and here we have a sort of symplectic quotient which turns out to be p1 this is not a coincidence uh, and this is a good segue to uh, this uh, sort of uh, very important theorem called the Kempfness theorem so again we are in the setting where m is some projective manifold omega is the restriction of the fubinish 2d metric with the corresponding moment map, then the Kempfness theorem says that there's a zero of mu in the orbit of, uh, of, of a point P if and only if this point is polystable. Or uh, correspondingly, there's a zero in the closure if and only if the point is semi stable. And moreover, if you uh, intersect GC with the zeros of mu, this in fact has a single G orbit, and hence, said theoretically, the GIT quotient will actually be equal to the symplectic quotient. And so in our example, I'll just explain this pictorially. We had these uh, sort of generic, uh, uh, I mean, generic uh, orbits. And then the zero set is basically represented by this line. So you can see that this sort of represents a P1 sitting inside. Uh, I mean, this represents a P1 uh, quotient. So this line represents uh, a P1. Okay, so uh, so maybe let me outline uh, the proof of Kempfness because this will uh, sort of motivate some of the definitions uh, in the next section. So the idea is to fix the lift of uh, P to Cn plus 1. So I'll call that hat P. And then one defines a functional M given by this formula. Here, uh, this is simply the Euclidean norm. And so this function is well defined on, on this uh, set of cosets because G is a unitary uh, is a subgroup of the unitary group. It turns out that uh, you have a critical point for this functional if and only if mu of G dot P is actually zero. So searching for zeros of the moment map is equivalent to searching for critical points of this functional. So this M should be script M. And then the idea is uh, you take uh, some psi in G and consider the restriction to, uh, I mean, look at the one parameter family generated by I times psi uh, and consider the restriction of the function to this. It turns out that the function is convex. So uh, this, this guy here is a symmetric space and it turns out that these things are, uh, are geodesics in that space. So, so you're basically saying that M is convex along geodesics. And then uh, one can argue that uh, the set is closed if and only if M is proper. Uh, but then if you have a proper functional, you can also check that if zero is not in the orbit, this is bounded below. So you have a proper functional, uh, which is convex. And then it of course has to have a critical point, right? It's a simple exercise, uh, calculus exercise. So this is how uh, Kempfness is proved. So let me end this section by uh, discussing a numerical criteria. So uh, uh, remember semi-stability and polystability were defined in terms of uh, the orbit closures of this group action. So it turns out by uh, a criteria called as Hilbert Mumford criteria, you in fact need to only look at orbit closures, which are, uh, which come from one parameter subgroups. So, so this makes it much easier to check. And the idea is that if you take a one parameter subgroup, uh, let Y be the limit uh, as you apply this uh, one parameter subgroup to some fixed point X, then Y will be a fixed point for this one parameter subgroup, which means that if you, uh, if you take uh, sort of the lift uh, to, uh, to Y hat, then uh, lambda T times Y hat will be a multiple of Y hat. 
uh, so, so it will be t to the some power w times y hat so then the weight is defined to be minus w and then uh, to check semi stability or poly stability you just need to check the sign of this weight okay so so essentially what i want you to take away from this is that you have these sort of one parameter subgroups you uh, define a certain weight at the limit and then you check the sign of the weight to decide whether the point that you originally started off with was semi stable or not okay all right so now that brings us to the final section so uh, it turns out that uh, donaldson observed this in the mid 90s that one could uh, put the scalar curvature problem into a moment map formalism but unfortunately that formalism is slightly technical and it's slightly uh, different from what we have been talking about so instead i'll directly work with uh, functionals analogous to this m functional that we had in the proof of kempfness and directly define stability so uh, again uh, our usual setting then the space of kähler forms in c1 of l can be parameterized by this uh, by this space uh, this is a sub uh, i mean this is basically an open set inside the set of c infinity functions so this turns out to be a fresh manifold modeled after uh, after uh, the space of smooth functions and which has a finsler metric uh, given uh, just defined by this i mean f is a tangent vector uh, to h omega at p so so that means it must be a c infinity function so you just compute its l1 norm with respect to the volume form defined by omega p okay uh, then uh, there is a certain functional called as the mabuchi functional which turns out to be convex along geodesics of the finsler metric and again these are all uh, i mean i'm not taking names but there are lots of people whose uh, contributions uh, go into uh, all these statements so people like mabuchi donaldson chen tamash darvas and so on and then one can sort of define a sort of geodesic stability by observing the slope of this uh, mabuchi functional at infinity so so if you notice if uh, in the finite dimensional picture if something is stable the slope at infinity has to be positive right so you can define some sort of geodesic stability and you decree that there will be strict positivity unless the geodesic comes from some trivial uh, in some trivial way namely from a holomorphic vector field so i don't want to go into technicalities but the problem with this is that uh, it's extremely hard to actually check geodesic stability because uh, it's uh, i mean it's a transcendental quantity so it's extremely hard to check so ideally one would like to replace this by a more algebraic quantity which is what uh, by a more algebraic criteria which is what is done by case stability so uh, because l is ample you have a kodaira embedding into a large projective space so then uh, in the spirit of the mumford uh, hilbert mumford criteria i let m degenerate via a one parameter subgroup of gln uh, gln plus 1 right so m might uh, so, uh, i mean i, I act uh, lambda of t on m and take the flat limit so that might be some scheme and then uh, it turns out that one can associate a certain weight similar to in the hilbert mumford criteria to this limit and then you define the weight of this degeneration uh, that's called the donaldson futaki invariant as the weight as computed on this limiting quantity so that's called the donaldson futaki invariant for this degeneration and now once you have a weight you know how to define semi stability so m is called k semi stable if for any kodaira embedding and any one parameter subgroup uh, your weight has to be non negative and then it's called poly stable if uh, equality holds if and only if w is actually in the gln orbit of m okay and the conjecture is that uh, m l admits a cck if it's k poly stable so heuristically uh, uh, semi stability is something like this where the slope at infinity is zero and poly stability is where the slope at infinity is is positive uh, unless you are in one of these sort of trivial directions 
So I should say that uh, this conjecture as stated, so by the way, this is called the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture. As stated, it's almost certainly wrong. Uh, the crucial point is that uh, uh, sort of this trivial uh, degeneration, uh, to, to even define a trivial degeneration is a rather subtle concept and maybe uh, the way I've defined this trivial degeneration here is, is maybe too strong. So maybe one has to relax this a bit. Also, uh, I mean, there are other relaxations, for instance, one can define what is called as a uniform case stability for which the conjecture is likely to be true. Uh, for K poly stability, as I've defined, the conjecture probably is wrong. But then uh, uniform case stability is again a hard condition to check. So the idea is one, one wants to get something in between, which will sort of be optimal and also, I mean, in the end, maybe all of these are, uh, are, are supposed to be essentially equivalent, but one wants to get a condition uh, under which one can show existence while it should also uh, be sort of a good enough condition that one can actually check with uh, by hand whether certain examples are case stable or not which for instance geodesic stability is not it's a hard condition to check okay so i guess i'll just have uh, five more minutes so maybe i'll uh, sort of quickly uh, go over this section so there is one important case where the conjecture is correct and that was one of the major uh, progress uh, ma uh, major breakthroughs in the field uh, in the last 10 years uh, or maybe even in the last 20 years. So uh, we call that the canonical line bundle, KM is the line bundle that's locally generated by uh, these top forms. So if L is uh, either KM or the dual of KM, then it turns out omega is CSCK if and only if it is scalar Einstein, uh, which means that uh, the Ricci form is a multiple of omega. Sorry, so, uh, so if L is actually the canonical line bundle uh, and the canonical line bundle is ample, then uh, by uh, this work of Oba and Yao, uh, it's known that there always exists the kähler einstein metric in, in C1 of Km. If, uh, if Km is trivial, then in fact by uh, Yao's work, which in part one in the Fields Medal, also shows that there is in fact a Ricci flat metric always and hence a CSCK metric in any Kähler class. So then in the so-called Fano case where uh, the dual of Km is positive, uh, this is the hard case. So notice that in this case, there is actually no requirement of case stability. You always have Kähler Einstein metrics, but in the Fano case, you actually need case stability, but in, in dimension n equals two, you actually don't, you need something simpler. Uh, so Tian uh, proved in the late uh, 80s and, and uh, early 90s that there exists a Kähler Einstein metric as long as the automorphism group is reductive. And then it was, uh, he also formulated uh, sort of the mo uh, first precise version of case stability. And then uh, very recently, uh, Chen Donaldson and Son proved that there in fact uh, case stability is sufficient for existence of Kähler Einstein metrics when L is uh, minus Km. And they used a continuity method through conical Kähler Einstein metrics. So I think I'm running out of time, so I won't have time to say more about this. But uh, I should uh, maybe just mention that as so uh, often happens in math, uh, once there is a big breakthrough, uh, there are suddenly multiple proofs. So in fact, in one year, uh, within three months, there were three new proofs, one uh, done in collaboration with uh, Gabor Zeklidi, where we used a smooth continuity method, which uh, is sort of a classical method that goes back to the method of Oba and Yao. So historically, this was, uh, this was rather, uh, uh, I mean, nice that one could uh, use the classical method to also get existence. But of course, we relied heavily on the work of uh, Chen Donaldson and Son. And the advantage here was that we were able to prove a G equivariant version, which helps in actually uh, constructing examples of Kähler-Einstein manifolds. Uh, soon enough, uh, in 
two months, there was a proof uh, by Chen, Wang, and Sun using uh, Kalerichi flow. And then the next month, uh, there was another proof uh, of completely different nature uh, by a variational approach. Uh, this variational approach actually proved a slightly weaker theorem because it assumed uniform case stability. But as I just mentioned, maybe in the CSCK problem, uniform case stability is the right condition to actually use. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll maybe skip this slide on the overview of the CDS method. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll also skip this uh, slide on the modula of Fano uh, varieties, but I'll end with, with mentioning this uh, dramatic recent development about two years back due to uh, Jingryu Cheng and uh, Chen, the same Chen who also worked on the Chen Donaldson Sun theorem. Uh, so if M is a Kähler manifold, then what they did was to get a priori estimates. So in, whenever you're solving any PDE, uh, there's, there's, there's usually a continuity method involved. So remember even Balaji talked about a sort of continuity method, even for solving PDEs, there's a sort of continuity method that's involved. And the key is always to obtain a priori estimates. So what they showed was that if you have a CSCK metric, then uh, the potential all derivatives are bounded as soon as you know that the C0 norm is bounded. So all subsequent derivatives are bounded in terms of the C0 norm. Okay, and as a consequence of this, they were actually able to show that uh, M admits a CSCK if and only if it is geodesic stable. So now the question that remains is uh, how are geodesic stability and case stability really related? And uh, so, of course, this seems like an algebraic problem. The other approach to actually solving the Yauti and Donaldson conjecture is more in tune with uh, the, the CDS method. You sort of set up a continuity argument and try to get some sort of geometric limits. But there, uh, you basically uh, have, have to develop a structure theory for Riemannian geometric limits which uh, under Ricci curvature bounds, which is what you obtain when you are working with uh, Kinder Einstein metrics. This is rather rich and well-developed by now due to the work of Cheeger, Polding, Tian, and so on. But in the scalar curvature side, I mean, if you only have constant scalar curvature and uh, let's say an L2 bound on the curvature, uh, on the full curvature tensor, then such a structure theory is, is not, uh, I mean, is lacking and is in fact a hard problem in Riemannian geometry. So that is another possible approach uh, uh, where you might be able to more directly use case stability rather than going via geodesic stability. All right, so uh, I'll, I also wanted to end with this perturbation problem, but I think I'm out of time. So I'll just leave this uh, slide as it is and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lata. Yeah. So now I will open the session for questions. Uh, okay. Right. So here yeah. is a question. There is, there is a question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, oh, should I be able to see the chat box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, sorry. I should. Uh, yeah, Ved, just click on the chat, the icon at the bottom of the screen that says yeah, chat. That's what, but I think I've, uh, I'm in the full screen mode, so I'm not able to... Uh, doesn't it pop up? Oh, it's going to be behind your screen. Uh, do you want me to read out the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, that might save more. That, yeah. That might save time. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is a question. Uh, I think that was posed on the YouTube channel and it's been relayed by Arpan. Okay. It's the question is in general, when does the moment map exist given an action of a compact Lie group G on a symmetric manifold M, uh, comma with a Kähler form mega? I suppose by demand the action has to be Hamiltonian. Right. So uh, I mean, uh, right. So so uh, the definition of a Hamiltonian action is that there exists a moment map. So that's a uh, tautological statement. 
but uh, one of the necessary conditions uh, or at least that's the definition i know so uh, so one of the necessary conditions is of course uh, you you can assume uh, that your manifold is simply connected because uh, i mean so so if your manifold is simply connected one can check that uh, there always exists a moment map uh, the other uh, so what happens in the, in these settings is that uh, your uh, your group action is not only an action on m but it also lifts to an action of l so so uh, there is a sort of uh, this called linearization in in algebraic geometry that there is an action on the total space of the line bundle and in that case you can actually show that uh, there will be a hamiltonian uh, for for any uh, any lie algebra element you will have a corresponding hamiltonian so so that is what happens in the setting of git because so so remember i i already assumed that uh, your g is sort of part a uh, subgroup of uh, of gln and we know that gln not only acts on pn but it actually acts on the uh, on the cone over pn right on all of cn plus 1 right so uh, so that means uh, i mean the total space of this line bundle will also be some sort of a cone inside uh, cn plus 1 and so your uh, group will also act on on that so, so it acts on the total space of the line bundle and then one can show that it will definitely be hamiltonian so i i i hope that answers the question okay uh, any other questions yeah probably a very naive question okay uh which is um uh in your talk throughout um you i mean since the question was about the existence of csck uh metrics so we are really the the focus is on keller forms and a lot of your definitions were uh stated as if one had had a keller structure in the background okay um now i don't know enough about this and so i's probably not able to decode some of your definitions but then um the notion of a moment map is 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 purely a real uh, real notion right true yeah yeah i mean uh, if i uh, uh so what is sort of the best uh, structure i need to endow a compact manifold with uh, if i, I mean, have a uh, with a uh, with 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 a riemannian structure no no just a symplectic structure just a symplectic structure yeah, yeah. so you can talk yeah. about hamiltonian actions for uh, symplectic manifolds and okay. in fact uh, this quotient that i looked at new inverse of zero by g that's uh, in fact uh, it's defined in the symplectic setting if you have a moment map and that's called i think the marston something symplectic reduction or something of that sort but but the point is that if your uh, symplectic structure actually comes from a keller structure then uh, in fact uh, uh, this mu inverse of uh, i mean the symplectic quotient actually becomes a genuine keller manifold as long as the group action is free and so on i see i see so okay. but yeah you can do it for symplectic uh, and in fact to i mean uh, i don't i don't know enough about these things but these uh, these things are, are, are uh, also defined for uh, symplectic manifolds so you have this whole industry which right which is essentially taking a complex line bundle of a symplectic manifold so uh, many of these things i think can be done in that generality but you have to make contact with git right so you need a keller structure okay i see right yeah thanks yeah no problem so can i ask a question yeah yeah sure so hi vid a very nice talk Hi, so yeah, I remember uh, we met in Notre Dame a few years back right uh, uh, exactly exactly yeah, yeah. hi so uh, my question was that is there any like geometric flow uh, proposal for like this yauti and lorentzian conjecture or oh, yeah, yeah. so so there is a, a flow called as the kalabi flow 
uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I mean, generally the experience has been that uh, it's much harder to understand flows than the corresponding elliptic problem. So right. Since, I mean, uh, uh, even though the scalarity approach worked only in a few months after we were able to make the uh, Obayao method work, uh, even then, I mean, uh, sort of many of the PD techniques involved in the Obayao method were known for about 30 years. Whereas scalar flow, they had to sort of newly develop all these tools. So the mm-hmm. experience is that flow is generally a harder uh, thing to deal with. Uh, but having said that, I should also mention that, uh, so this a priori estimate of Cheng and Chen in that same yeah. paper, they prove a rather remarkable uh, condition. So, so nobody as of now knows whether the Kalabi uh, flow even exists for all time. Okay. So oh, that's I see. the first okay. step, right? In any flow, you right. don't know if it exists for all time. But what these guys proved uh, uh, is that the flow exists as long as the scalar curvature doesn't blow up. And I this see. is again quite remarkable because, uh, I mean, a priori it was known that uh, the flow doesn't blow up if the curvature doesn't blow up. Right. And, you know, for even for Kehler Ricci flow, those are sort of standard she type estimates, right? Right, right, right. But uh, what they were able to actually do is not even Ricci curvature being bounded, but they were actually able to reduce it to scalar curvature being bounded. So that oh, is a pretty remarkable amazing, yeah. achievement. Yeah. But uh, okay. I mean, yeah, it's conjectured the Kalabi flow exists for all time, but uh, I don't think. I mean, there are examples so, where this is known, but I don't think anyone has any idea in general. Yeah. So I guess then there are like no examples or of singularities of this Kalabi flow yet. Then, if it, uh, they are conge- we, uh, not that I know of in finite time. Uh, okay. Of course, at infinite time, there would be uh, most likely there would be singularities. There would also, uh, in the unstable case, uh, most likely there would also be collapsing because you have basically these. Uh, uh, I mean, there are examples of projective manifolds where it basically breaks up into two complete pieces and so on. And you have collapsing at sort of each end of these complete manifolds. So, so the geometry is much more complex. So at infinity, of course, there are uh, known examples of singularities. But as far as I know, for finite time, I don't think anyone knows. Because uh, in this paper of Cheng and Chen, they actually put this as a conjecture. Uh, not only as oh, a question, yeah. but as a conjecture that the... Kalabi flow exists for all time. So okay. I think yeah, there are no known examples of finite time singularity. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. If there are any other questions? Uh... Okay. So then we should thank uh, Professor Data. Thank you.